Today, we're talking with a conservative CMC professor, John Shields, and a progressive Pitzer professor, Phil Zuckerman. Together, the team teach a class on free speech on college campuses. They seek to promote open dialogue, ideological diversity, and reasoned debate around various contentious issues confronting college's campus today. Today, we, look, we take an inside look into their class. We learn about how ideas can be challenged and respected. Uh, their class typically has a waiting list that's quite long. For CMC, it's very much a part of our new Open Academy initiative, which is about bringing diverse viewpoints to our campus and making sure our students enjoy uh, open and productive dialogue with diverse viewpoints. Professor Shields, you're the first one up. I turn it over to you. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Evan. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I have to say, I feel a, a real... Uh, kinship with all the parents in the audience today because our oldest child, his name is Isaiah, and he's a junior in high school this year. And that means we're terrifyingly close to becoming you, right? Like our child is about to become a college student and we've got to figure out how to finance this thing and, you know, land him in a good institution. And then after that, we've got two more children to get through college. Um, so, um, so we're, we're, we're feeling very daunted by all of this. It's, I also feel a real kinship with Phil Zuckerman, uh, who's here with me today. I, I appreciate Phil joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with him once again. And I want to say just a few words about how our partnership came together and why I think it matters. And then I'm going to kick it over to Phil. Although Phil, you can feel free to interrupt and correct me when I get things wrong. Uh, so feel free to chime in as I go along here. So um, if, if you don't know me, I'm, I teach American politics here at Claremont McKenna College. I've been here for 13 years. And since I've gotten here, I, I've tended to teach courses on controversial topics. So this semester, I'm teaching a course on policing. Uh, I'm teaching another course on the American culture wars. And then I'm also teaching this course with uh, on free speech with, with Phil Zuckerman. And to be honest, when I first got to CMC and I started teaching courses on controversial topics, I did it, I did it mostly because it was just kind of fun. You know, like I thought it was an interesting way to sort of organize and structure uh, a, a course on politics to build it around contemporary controversies. Um, I also was an assistant, profenure, uh, assistant professor trying to get tenure, so I didn't want my teaching evaluations to suck, right? And I didn't want my teaching evaluations to suck because I really wanted to get tenure, which I earned, uh, you know, about uh, eight years ago. And I have to say, being tenured is the greatest thing in the world. It never gets old. Every morning I wake up with tenure, I feel happy about it. Um, it's really a wonderful institution. But over time, I developed I developed a deeper appreciation for why I think teaching controversy matters. Um, and it matters just not because it's fun, right? I, I think it matters, it matters because I think a great college should do more than teach writing skills or analytical skills or introduce students to a broad right, um, universe of knowledge. Um, a, a great education and, and a great classroom should also be a sort of school of democracy, right? That is to say, I think we all need to learn how to be good citizens, right? And we need to learn how to become citizens, good citizens by encountering, encountering folks who aren't us, right? We need to encounter the, more, the varied moral and intellectual traditions that have shaped our country. Uh, we need to learn how to disagree in thoughtful and constructive ways. We need to learn how to see uh, how, how to acquire intellectual humility, right? Um, and to see the world through different angles of vision. And because all of these things don't come naturally, right? In fact, a lot of these things don't, right? A lot of these skills, uh, I think, are, are actually quite unnatural in a lot of ways. Because these things don't come naturally to human beings, it seems to me we need schools of democracy, right? We need ed we need educational institutions to help us cultivate these democratic virtues. And I think this sort of democratic education, it's always important, but I would say it's, it's especially important now, right? In this moment of enhanced, I think, suspicion, tribalism and polarization. Right? And so I, I think it's important to teach controversial topics because I think again, it, it's, it's, we need to learn how to become good citizens and we do it through engaging those kinds of issues. 
Um, but it also occurred to me that the ideal classroom, the ideal school of democracy, should be taught by professors with different views. Okay. And at the same time I had that thought, our campuses were also being convulsed by topics over free speech. And so it also occurred to me that it was important to teach that debate because that felt like, you know, four or five years ago, that really felt like the debate on college campuses, right? Sort of what should be the contours of free speech on university campuses? Um, what is the purpose of a university education? Um, are there some ideas we should push outside, right? Sort of the university and its, um, and it's outside the university community. So um, I reached out to Phil Zuckerman, uh, who's a progressive uh, sociologist at Pitzer. I mentioned his politics um, because I'm moderately conservative. So if you read the New York Times, I suppose I'm sort of a Ross Dothat conservative, maybe a David Brooks conservative, somewhere in that general terrain. And uh, I suspect Phil is Phil seems to be more of a Bernie Sanders type progressive, although maybe he would characterize his politics a little differently. So I'll let him do that. And um, and so we came up with a class that we call the University Blacklist. And the class explores debates over free speech, uh, primarily by assigning authors who've been disinvited from college campuses or otherwise censored for things that um, uh, that they've said or written. And uh, so we assign mostly books uh, by, these, by these authors. These authors are not just conservatives, I should emphasize, there are progressives and lefties on our, our list as well. And we look at a bunch of hot topics. We look at topics like Black Lives Matter, controversies over transgender, uh, controversies over sexual assault on college campuses, uh, just to name a few. And in the classroom, Phil tends to defend those authors with more progressive views. I tend to defend those with more conservative views. We do this even when we don't always agree with these authors. Um, <clears throat> and um, as we do this, I think I help check some of his blind spots. He checks some of mine. And, um, and I think that's beneficial for students in a couple of ways. One, I think it shows it demonstrates that we're fallible creatures, right? I mean, Phil and I know a lot. Uh, we've got PhDs, we've written books, but we don't know, we don't know everything, certainly. We're, we're deeply fallible. Um, and it's also an opportunity for us to model what um, thoughtful debate should look like, right? Um, I think the other virtue of co-teaching that's, that's maybe a little less obvious, but I think it's just as important. I think the other real benefit to co-teaching is that it helps make the classroom more diverse. Okay. Often, often classrooms don't reflect the ideological diversity and philosophical diversity that exist on college campuses. Um, and that's because students tend to self-segregate into different kinds of classrooms, different sorts of majors. In fact, one recent study found that a student's politics is the best predictor of their undergraduate major, right? So conservatives tend to gravitate into the STEM fields and uh, sometimes economics. Uh, liberal and progressive students tend to track into more humanities disciplines. And so even when you get diversity on a college campus is often the classroom, that critical intellectual space, right? So important, often doesn't reflect the larger diversity of the classroom. Frank Bruni, who's a columnist at the New York Times put this very well. He said, and I'm quoting Frank here. He said, quote, a given college may be a heterogeneous archipelago but most of its students spend the bulk of their time on one of many homogenous islands. Right? And so this is, um, so one of the things that's really struck Phil and I is that um, our class does tend to attract students with uh, uh, really from across the political spectrum uh, and our classes feel more politically and philosophically diverse than I think classes that we just solo teach on our own, right? And sometimes, and sometimes, um, that's meant that's that's allowed for real friendships across real divides to to happen in our classroom. I mean, when we first taught this class, we had our, our most liberal student and our most conservative student became fast friends. You know, they walked to class together, um, they walked home together, they uh, they got to know each other, they talked a lot about, about politics, not just in our classroom but outside of it as well. And that's really one of our hopes for the class, right? That it can create new communities of conversation across political differences, across philosoph philosophical differences, and that these communities of conversation and friendship will endure long after they take our class. Okay, 
Um, that's, um, I want to pitch it over to Phil. I completely disagree with everything you just said, John. No, just kidding. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. It's not often that I get invited to the hallowed halls of CMC. So good to see you all. Um, I'm not, we're not all bomb throwing anarchists over here at Pitzer. Uh, maybe just, just, just 75% of us. Um, so thank you. And thanks, John. Uh, a lot of, a lot of what John covered, I was going to cover, but I'll add a little bit. Um, by the way, quickly, John, just so I forgot, um, you know, about paying for your kids for college. Simple. We just do what every other industrialized democracy does and make college tuition free. Uh, but sorry, don't mean to start that uh, ball rolling. Uh, my, uh, but I, having lived in Denmark for two years and seeing what uh, the kids um, there pay for college, which is nothing, they get paid to go. And, and my kids, my daughter just graduated from McAllister. Another one was attending art school in Seattle, but COVID threw a number on that. And my 15 year old is still in high school. But anyway, um, what I was gonna, oh, I'm also opposed to tenure, John. So I'm glad you wake up every time. See, this is one of those things where you think I'm a progressive, but I think tenure's bunk. Anyway, um, my name's Phil. I grew up in the, uh, on the mean streets of Pacific Palisades in Southern California. It's near Santa Monica and Malibu. I, uh, I've been here at Pitzer for 23 years. Uh, I uh, teach in sociology. I started a program in secular studies and I'm currently working as associate dean, so I've got my plate full right now. Um, but all is well, and I'm just great, so grateful that John reached out to me. It was his idea. He reached out. We met at Some Crust for coffee. We had lunch at Harvey Mudd. We got together, and it's it's really a highlight of my academic career. It's a highlight of what I do, and I'll just I'll give you some bullet points. On, on what I, what, why I think it's just such a great model. I think the biggie is having team teaching a class like this with John um, keeps me honest. And what I mean by that is, you know, hey, I'm good at ranting. I'm a professor. I, I love to rant and, and I get on my high horse. I carry it around with me wherever I go. And so if I'm teaching a social class, let's say a classical sociology, I teach classes in social theory. I teach classes on religion and secularism. I teach classes, uh, you know, intro classes, race class, gender stuff. I mean, sociology is a very um, connected to contemporary issues. It's not, I'm not teaching medieval French literature. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I am looking at crime and race and gender and sexuality and religion and you know politics things that things that are on the front page of the news every day and when i'm alone look i can get into a groove i can get into a rant i'm looking at a classroom full of bright-eyed you know 19 year olds on average sometimes they're older sometimes they're younger and the um ease with which one can unconsciously um straw man the opponent, mischaracterize an issue. Again, I try not to, but I found with John there, he keeps me honest. In other words, I don't think I'm a dishonest person, but I know that everything I'm gonna throw out there and everything I'm gonna say and everything I'm gonna uh, present to the students, John can either correct, counter, contextualize, suggest a different reading. So it makes me a better instructor. It makes me a better professor because I have John there to, you know, maybe keep me honest isn't the wrong word, but maybe sort of keep me clear thinking, keep me on point and make sure I'm not over exaggerating or I know that's redundant. The next is I want to return to that issue of straw manning. I think, you know, one of the worst things that we do, but we all, I think we all tend to do it is if there's a contentious issue or there's opposition, um, we can present the other side in its worst light, right? We can caricature the other side. We can present the other side as um, mean-spirited, awful, or as John Stuart Mill said, immoral, right? This is about the worst thing you can say about those who disagree with you. Um, but ideally, ideally, I think the, the, the goal should be that if we have disagreements, that we present our opposition in the best of lights and then proceed to explain why they're mistaken or wrong. In other words, don't present the worst case scenarios and the worst 
uh, loud mouths and the worst, you know, but actually try to present the best arguments from the other side and then show why we still might disagree. And this dynamic really forces that to occur more often than not. Uh, with John there, you know, I, I can't just get away with saying, you know, well, Rush Limbaugh said this and Fox News said that. So there you go, because he's he knows the the more sane uh, uh, and rational and reasonable um, um, right wing thinkers. I think he knows all all two of them. So he's able to bring their their names up a lot. And then um, the other thing is, oh, yeah, we talked about I, I agree with John that the demonization right now is so toxic. I'm only 51, so I haven't I don't know what it was like uh, in previous generations, but it seems like right now. I actually, it was probably really bad in the past as well. I mean, heck, civil war. But I mean, right now, uh, and during the Vietnam War, I think there was a lot of polarization as well. But it just seems right now, you know, under Trump and whatnot, that there's just been this hatred of the other side and MAGA is evil or Black Lives Matter is evil or each side views the other as a threat to America, as a threat to democracy. And one side, you know, is, is uh, you know, a threat, a danger because they're going to bring, I don't know, communism to America. The other th side is going to bring a, a fascist takeover, you know, and, and I do find that, the, that a lot of these issues, whether it's transgenderism or Black Lives Matter or, you know, the stolen election, you know, that, that it's hard to see each other as fellow Americans, as fellow human beings. And, and, and that's what it is. It's a good faith exercise. We have to argue in good faith with each other. Um, I respect John tremendously. And so I have to constantly check myself and say, whoa, 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 whoa. Am I demonizing the conservative voices in our country? Look at John. He, he, he's a sort of, I can't get away with that demonization or look at the other students. You know, at Pitzer College, one of the, one of the, the greatest things about working at Pitzer is also one of the worst things. And that is we're a young college. We were founded in the 60s on very 60s ideals. And we have these very explicit um, values of social justice, intercultural understanding, environmental uh, uh, um, friendliness, and progressive uh, and progress. Um, you know, community engagement, which are wonderful, wonderful values that I'm so proud to be a part of. However, the downside is we tend to attract a pretty homogenous or ideologically homogenous group of students. You know, we tend to attract. Um, students who are left and progressive and care about the environment and care about racial injustice and uh, women's rights and gay rights and so on and so forth. So our classrooms tend to be really, really darn homogenous. And what that what that means is um, I just don't get to meet a lot of students that think differently. And what I love is when, as John said, I might attract some progressive students, John may attract some conservative students, and so it's really wonderful for me to meet young, thoughtful, conservative students. There's some right now that are expanding my mind, turning me on to stuff I otherwise wouldn't know about or read. So it's wonderful. I'm almost done here. The other thing, two more points, is what I also like about this class is we probably, left and right divides aren't so clear cut as you might think. And this comes up time and time again. I'll give you an example. Um, I consider myself very progressive, very left, uh, and yet I find myself often alone when it comes to the free speech issue. It seems like a lot of my colleagues and a lot of the students at Pitzer don't seem to understand or value free speech. And, and I don't wanna like trash talk John here, but I think I, I may be more of a free speech fanatic and fundamentalist than John is. Uh, so often we're actually, we twist that one around in terms of right and left. Um, the other thing is, you know, there's some issues like uh, transgender issues that I may not perfectly align with others on the left. So I enjoy this class because it, it gets me to see that, you know, these, these designations are, are hard, but they're not steel hard. There, there are areas where we maybe don't fit in so nice and neatly to these left, right uh, boxes. And I think that's really important. And then finally, I just want to echo what John said about a model, you know, John is, is easily, and this will probably occur even here, that the more calm <laughs> and centered and I would say polite of the two of us. And I appreciate that. I can't tell you how many classes I end feeling like I was a little out of line, too, too harsh, too all over the place, too aggressive, 
too rude. I often write apologetic emails to the students after class. We just have different styles. Um, and it's funny because I, well, I don't know, it's just anecdotal, but I do notice that progressives, I think have more, have the better values globally and politically, but we tend to be assholes in person. And I find that conservatives have just, you know, horrific values globally and politically, but they're awful nice people in person. Um, and, that, and our class seems to <laughs> replicate that. But, um, but again, and then finally, you know, what's nice too is what John and I, when we disagree, I, I find time and time again, it's not about facts usually, it's usually sort of about a worldview, an orientation, how we interpret those facts. And, and in those cases, it's, it's not a wrong or right. You know, it's not like I can prove this or he can prove that. It's just sort of how do we understand the world? And that may have to do with how we were raised, the communities we grew up in, that shapes us in an even broader or maybe more nebulous sense than a narrow political affiliation or whatnot. So um, I'm just so grateful that John reached out and invited me into this endeavor. I love it. And I wish, in all honesty, I wish every class was taught this way, whatever the subject, oppositional viewpoints from different disciplines. So students get this. It's more of a dialogue. It's more dynamic. It's more dialectical and it's more mind expanding. So sorry, you're not all in the class because you'd love it. Thank you so much. Maybe for uh, maybe for alumni weekend at one point, maybe next year we can have a uh, everyone re a required book reading and maybe a, a little mock class. Uh, That's a great idea. Very fun. Uh, we had a question come in from um, John McDowell, and then we'll go to Mark. Um, John asks if you could talk a bit about some of the books you cover and what the sides are. So maybe what's the what's the more controversial book maybe, uh, and what are the two sides that are kind of the most contentious? John, do you want to? Do you want to start? Oh, you to I'm not sure that we have a, I guess in my mind, Phil, I'm not sure there's a single book that stands out as the most contentious. Is there for you? Probably The War on Cops by Heather McDonald. I think that's a yeah. real push, pushes a lot of buttons. I think, um, I'm, I'm just looking right now. I think, uh, well, we read Infidel, Ion Hirsi Ali. Uh, which can tend to push, push a lot of buttons. Um, interestingly enough, I felt like John Stuart Mill generated a lot of debate, which I found really interesting because uh, what's there to debate? He's such a genius. And then, um, and then just kidding. Um, we haven't gotten to unwanted advances yet, but so I'll give, you, I'll give you an example here with the war on cops. It's, you know, it's a kind of discussion of the current crisis in policing and the current crisis in race relations related to, to policing. And so we have, a, I have a lot of students who just take it for granted, just take it for granted that the police is a racist, corrupt institution and most cops aren't to be trusted and they are out to hunt and kill peoples of color. And, you know, Heather McDonald is a very, very serious, thoughtful, empirically grounded uh, 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 voice out there and thinker who comes along and says, actually the Black Lives Matter movement may be doing a disservice to communities of color and may actually be making things worse for those communities. And the hype around police violence against uh, uh, unarmed black men is, is, is hype. So you can imagine this creates tremendous, um, tremendous controversy in our classrooms. And she was the speaker that was invited to CMC and you know, there was a big uproar and really kind of spurred this creation of this class in a way. Um, so that's just one example. I would say with Ayan Hirsi Ali, she's a uh, African, African woman from Somalia who was a Muslim who then came out and repudiated Islam and became one of Islam's leading uh, critic of Islam, one of the most vocal critics of Islam. She has paid for it with basically her life. She's under constant death threats. But so she's interesting because she's a woman of color and she supports women's rights. So you would think progressive students would like her, yet she's very critical of Islam. And so she's dubbed Islamophobic and she's also embraced, been embraced by conservatives in America and has in turn welcomed that. So she's a real polarizing figure as well. I, I would just add to that. I mean, you know, really a powerful thread through the course is the question of free speech. So we start with John Stuart Mill and we read some of his critics. And this is a debate that I think cuts in ways students don't expect because I'm a sort of soft Burkean conservative. So that means I'm 
I'm actually not a John Stuart Mill person in some absolutist way, right? That is, I think that the conservative tradition gives us reasons to think that free speech or our freedom just generally needs to be regulated by norms, you know? And so I'm, um, you know, I think that, um, you know, I don't think that the university should look like the public square largely, right? That the, that the university has a particular mission and end, which is truth seeking free speech, you know, broad free speech generally advances that project, but, but it needs, you know, if we're gonna have productive conversations and discussions, we need all kinds of social norms that regulate our speech, right? And govern our speech. Um, so uh, on the other hand, I think Phil is, if I could speak for you, Phil, comes out of, a, you know, um, he's, he's a, sort of an enlightenment liberal, you know? His heroes are, um, you know, J uh, uh, John Stuart Mill, right? And he, he thinks that um, free speech should not be regulated. So one of the things that surprises our students and one of the things we do is that Phil can give the progressive students who might be inclined to want to censor speakers, he gives them reasons to suppose that maybe they should have a more liberal position on speech. And I give my more conservative students a, a sense that there might be conservative reasons to think that speech should be regulated and limited in some ways. So I think that's one of the interesting things that's come out in this class and in our conversations. And I think it's a, a kind of healthy and, and, and interesting thing we, 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 um, we do with students. As a quick follow up to that before we, we jump over to Mark. Um, how do students, you know, you, you enter as a liberal student or conservative student really from either campus. Do you find that students are still arguing um, uh, or discussing the vantage point that they, they came in with, or do you see them changing their mind? Do you see them arguing uh, the other side? How, how do you see that interaction happening in the classroom? Yeah, I'll go first. I mean, um, well, it, 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 um, that's a good question. I, I think that students, um, uh, my sense of students generally is that um, is that they're you know they they to me at least they always seem a lot more open than they sometimes are, are I think are are seen more just publicly and just more broadly you know I mean I think students have gotten at least my experience with students has been that they're curious about the world and they recognize on some level that there's a lot of topics that they don't know a lot about so they might come in with a provisional view that's in some ways, um, you know that that some that sometimes seems strong at first, you know. But they're they're often, I think, if they encounter, you know, if they encounter a sort of serious book, um, that they do take it seriously, you know, um, and uh, they do they do sort of wrestle with it in a serious way. Every great once in a while, I don't know what Phil's experience is, but every great once in a while, I'll, 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 I'll have a student that I just think is uneducatable on some level, right? Like they just, like, like I've got nothing to offer them. And I don't think my colleagues have anything to offer them because they've just made up their mind about everything, you know? And they're sort of, um, you know, so if, for those very rare students, I'm not quite sure what they get out of education, right? Um, but that to me is the... Uh, is the exception to the rule, you know? It And it doesn't mean that students always do some dramatic, in fact, they rarely do some dramatic course shift, but they do often calibrate their position some, you know? I mean, they do, I think they do come away with a sort of, even if they come away broadly with the same position, it's a lot more informed and sophisticated and serious, right, um, than the one they came in with. I don't know, what's your sense, Phil? Um, I think the truth is, I think the students that take this class are a bit more open-minded. They're the less closed-minded. So I think they want to be a challenged and have their mind expanded. I'll, I'll, give you an ex I'll give you an example of the kind of student that didn't take our class. Okay. So this is a, an email I received uh, back in the fall uh, from a student of mine, an advisee of mine, uh, who says, hi again, Phil. As I am seriously considering trying to enroll in the university blacklist, I have some reservations and was wondering if you could give me your opinion. I'm concerned as a very progressive socialist, and as you probably remember, I'm pretty outspoken, that being in a course with a conservative professor 
will be very stressful and take a toll on my psychological well-being. Do you think this is the case or do you think it's the kind of course where my strong moral ethos and passion could thrive? <laughs> so this was my response. Well, blank, I personally subscribe to the venerable adage put forth by Robert Frost, quote, education is the ability to listen to almost anything without losing your temper or your self-confidence, unquote. If being in a class with a conservative professor and hearing his point of view is likely to be very stressful for you and possibly take a psychological toll on your well-being, perhaps the class is not for you, best Phil. Of course, it's not what I wanted to say was, are you fucking kidding me? But I, sorry, I tried not to get through this without swearing. Um, I tried to get through this. But you know, that was the best I could muster. And of course, she didn't take the class. He or she didn't take the class. So there's an example of that kind of person who is, is so close-minded and so narrow. And I got a few others. And then we even had somebody who, who was in the class this semester and then saw the topics, right? So these are the topics. This is how we've done it. We do it by topic. So topic one is kind of, you know, the case for free speech where we set up some of the theoretical groundwork. And then we go to freedom and censorship in campus today where we look at some actual uh, on the ground situations, provocateurs, next comes Islam, next comes Black Lives Matter, next comes critical theory, next comes colonialism, sexual assault and transgender. These are the themes of the topics. And we had a student who took the class and after the first week said, well, I'm so offended by this syllabus because these things are not up for debate, you know, Black lives do matter, so I'm dropping the class. And I, you know, I wrote back, I said, it's not that these topics are up for the debate, so these are the themes that we're gonna be exploring. But so this is a long way of me saying, I think the students that we get do change their minds, do have their framing challenged, but that's also because I think they want that. They're, they're, they're more open-minded. And the ones that are so narrow on either the left or right probably just don't bother with us. Thank you. Mark Schwartz, if you'd like to unmute and ask your question. Thank you, Evan. And it's a great follow up um, to your uh, last question. Clearly, whoever uh, thought of that question has had the benefit of the finest undergraduate education available in North America. Um, <clears throat> so um, my, my uh, question, uh, sorry, Phil. Um, my question is about um, uh, pedagogical uh, techniques and, um, you know, critical thinking skills. Um, and to some extent, um, I'm influenced uh, largely here by the last um, commencement speaker, uh, virtually, um, uh, actually, I'm sorry, in person, um, Arthur Brooks, who's uh, one of his most famous is Love Your uh, Enemy. Um, and how um, I've tried to incorporate that. My, my question is, um, from an intellectual uh, perspective and a, a teaching perspective, have you uh, guys ever thought about reversing roles? And um, Phil uh, teach uh, from a conservative perspective and John uh, teach uh, from, I think you call it progressive uh, perspective. Um, and then, actually uh, transfer that uh, process to the students. So um, the, the progressives have to take, um, you know, the opposite sides and, and, and vice versa. And, and, you know, that might very well, um, you know, not change their mind, but equip them uh, to deal with uh, difficult situations in the future. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good suggestion, Mark. Do you want, uh... Phil, do you want me to go first or do you want to? I'll just say I love it. I'm all for it. And I think we yeah. need to have a second, like a, a, a B, you know, like a higher level class uh, where we do that. Yeah, Mark, I think it's, I think it is a good suggestion. We've done it sort of in a soft way. I mean, in their essays, you know, they're supposed to make an argument for and against uh, the books that they're reading. Um, and uh, Phil and I haven't um, role swapped. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting suggestion. Let me just say a quick word about friendship though. I think that is interesting. I mean, and, and you mentioned Arthur Brooks and the importance of love and friendship. I mean, one of the things that's possible 
in a small liberal arts college is real friendships, right? And that's why I, 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 I ended with uh, my comments by noting that friendship. And one of the things we really tried to do, um, we, can't, we haven't been able to do it this semester because we're all online, but the two prior times we taught the course, we took students out to dinners in the village and we wanted there to be space and opportunity for students to really um, really become friends, right? Really to see one another really as three-dimensional people and, and develop some affection for one another, right? And, um, and I think that's really important anytime you're in a class, uh, in anytime you're teaching controversial topics, right? Like if you actually like someone, um, it's a lot easier. We're all inclined to actually lean toward them and try to, even if we disagree with them, we're more inclined to try to take them seriously. And so, um, so I think, again, that's, that's the advantage of teaching at a small college. And I think we try to leverage that as much as we can. And one of the things we're really looking forward to when we get back next year is to bring that part of the, part of the class back, back in. You know, I think we really have missed it this semester. Can, can I just make a, a follow-up? Um, you know, uh, listening to Arthur Brooks every two weeks, uh, as, as I religiously do, even though I'm Jewish and he's Catholic, um, you know, I thought a lot about um, love your enemies in a CMC context. And um, I, I just want to share this. So um, at the last in-person alumni weekend, um, one of the people um, who was a guest is someone that, you know, my initial reaction to them is reprehensible. You know, I, I, I cannot stand what they stand for. And what Arthur Brooks has taught me to do is, in my own mind, play a game of what would I say um, to that person in the context of love your enemies. And um, what I came up with is um, a, a line that you really need me because you have no other perspective on what the other side is thinking. And, um, you know, from my days at CMC, Machiavelli teaches us to keep your friends close and your enemies closer. And so to understand what your other side is thinking makes you better able to respond. And so your class provides great training for lawyers and problem solvers and, and people who are gonna do good. And I think, you know, making people reverse roles of good cop, bad cop, and then bad cop, good cop, and who's who really is a great negotiating strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's a point well taken. I mean, um, and it's an interesting point too, Mark, that you're making about um, about loving one en one's enemies, right? I mean, it suggests that there's it's not just you don't just have to summon some you know um, to love one's enemies. You don't merely need to be you know um, to summon some kind of extraordinary grace to use a Christian term, right? Like you can you have a sort of self interest in it too, right? <laughs> like you you need them. And I think that's, um, and it's actually at a point that you see in John Stuart Mill as well. And it's, um, it's well made. Great uh, question in the chat. And then we'll go to Laura. Um, what is a conservative idea that you have more sympathy for now, Professor Zuckerman? And for Professor Shields, a liberal idea. So is there something that really has changed in you through these, this class? Oh man, that's a tough one. Maybe we should slip do switch sides now like the, like the Mark suggested. Um, well, I guess what I would say is what, okay, what, what is there, is there a left wing issue that I've changed my mind on? Is that the question? Uh, a right wing issue that you have become more open to, a more conservative position that you think, oh, that's not as bad or as extreme as I thought it was. Um, I think a couple, I think I am more, I do think that there are good faith reasons to ab oppose abortion. So I am very much pro-abortion. I am very much for women controlling their own reproductive rights and controlling what happens in their own bodies. 
but I do believe one can oppose abortion for, for reasonable reasons and not unreasonable reasons. Uh, and that's come through John and some of the other students and some of the readings we've gotten. I also would say that I think um, John has helped me see the ways in which um, there, there's, a, there's a tendency for progressives or liberals to want to tear things down, you know, burn the mother down, just, you know, a sort of destructive vibe that, you know, can have unexpected or unintended consequences and that it's, it's not good to be rash. And if you're going to destroy something, you have to be able to replace it with something. And what are you, what are you replacing it with? And are you just wanting to tear down and a value for institutions? So I don't share those to the same degree that John does, but he's helped me see things that way. And then of course, the last one though, is just free speech, just the, the degree to which progressive students these days don't understand free speech, don't understand how it works, don't understand how it protects them. And I'm just appalled and aghast. So I find myself in the company of right wingers when it comes to this free speech issue. Uh, so I would say that's off the top of my head. After this call, I'll probably right. several others. John, what do you think? Yeah, I think one of the things that Phil has pressed me on is, is both the healthcare issue and uh, to some degree, the gun issue. I mean, I think both are issues that, you know, I, I mean, it's, I, I, I've, I've come around to the view that it's not obvious to me, you know, why, um, why healthcare should necessarily be different from education, for example, right? Like if it's a, it's a public good, um, it's not, it's, um, I, I think there's a sort of case there that, and Phil, I think has been good at pressing sort of the, the, the unfairness of our, our healthcare system. And I think that's, you know, it's one of those issues that I, I never, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't have a particularly hard view on, but I had a sort of provisional one that was sort of consistent with my own team, broadly speaking. But it's not one I'd sort of given the, I think Phil's forced me to think about it, um, I think more than I otherwise would have if he had not been for his, his, you know, him pressing me on it. And I would sort of say something similar with guns. I mean, it's not clear, guns are something that, um, you know, I'm, I'm, and I, I would say broadly the, also the war on drugs. I mean, I, I, I think both of those issues, um, I think over time, especially the war on drugs. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure, um, you know, what should be guns. I mean, drugs are probably, I mean, I'm not sure what to do about them, uh, but I think the war has been very costly. And, and I think Phil and, and, and some of my progressive colleagues just generally too have persuaded me of that, right? That that's, uh, so I've, I've, I've moved on that issue for sure. Thank you both. Laura, if you'd like to unmute and ask your question. Great, thanks, Evan. Thanks for organizing this fantastic program and uh, Professor Zuckerman and Shields. So wonderful to have you here, but also teaching this class. Uh, the Open Academy, I think is one of the greatest initiatives CMC has going right now and just so exciting on so many levels. And um, as a mediator professionally, I um, sit right in that sweet spot of, <laughs> of polarized debate um, all the time. And so um, I actually have probably about an hour's worth of questions, which I will not ask all at once in fairness to the other participants. So I'm, I've been sitting here trying to figure out what it is to ask you. Um, and I think I wanna build on Mark's points because I, I really believe that this idea of uh, friendships is so important. Um, because I think when you come at these discussions with an underlying foundation of trust and openness, it's an entirely different discussion than having the same content discussed with people who don't start with that that foundation. I've just I've been in a workshop just recently with with a group of participants who theoretically should have been absolutely considered like-minded, all kind of coming from the same space. And because there were sort of two groups that didn't know each other, the whole thing decayed into a real mess. And it was because there wasn't just sort of this understanding of trust at the beginning. Um, and so I guess I'm interested in, in hearing you talk about a couple of things. One is, what is your philosophy of common ground? Um, should we try to find common ground? Is that helpful or does it detract from mm -hmm. the um, the mission to truly mm -hmm. listen and understand the other perspective rather than sort of seeking out 
that sort of, you know, small common denominator that we can agree on. Um, so that, and then also wondered if you have um, waded into this uh, field of new research on oxytocin and how oxytocin and trust, um, or how oxytocin impacts the creation of trust, but also um, their finding creates um, a, a very instinctive polarization, right? A distrust. So if somebody is an other, then we hear the facts, we hear what they're saying with a, a much higher degree of skepticism, just biologically. And so we, you know, you, we can use strategies to sort of put everybody on the same team to reduce that, you know, that um, automated reflex of skepticism. Um, but just sort of wondered about, you know, your own philosophies about how to, how to think about common ground and how to think about building alliances across initially polarized communities or groups? Mm -hmm. That's a hard one. Uh, that's a great question. Um, uh, Phil, you want to field it first or do you want me to go? I, I'll just say that it's not my area of expertise. Um, it's getting to be now that I'm working as an administrator, obviously I have to develop those <laughs> skills a bit more. I, I, I guess the two things I would say is I have read a little bit, a lot about oxytocin uh, when I was writing a book on morality and I read, there's a guy at CGU actually, who's a big name in that research area. He's published, I think he published the love, the love hormone or whatever it was called. So yeah, I'm a big fan of it. I like petting my dog's head and feeling it. Um, but it, <laughs> but I, does it, that, that's as far as I go. I've just read about it. Um, in terms of the common ground issue, obviously I think um, it's great to to start with, all right, well, where, where can we agree? What, 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 let's establish some things that we both agree on and, um, you know, and then go from there. And, but I will say it, I am horrible at doing it. I mean, in real life, I'm just, I throw out insults. I'm caustic. I'm sarcastic. I'm sardonic. I'm disrespectful. So I'm not the best at it but I would like to be mindful of it. But, but I think what John has said is really true in terms of now we're online, but when we are in person and we have those dinners and we sit in a circle and the class is on a Friday afternoon, a, a, a spirit of goodwill is just there. It just, and it grows and it certainly helps us um, disagree with each other in a more polite and open-minded way. But but that's about it, I could say at this point. John, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 something I'm gonna have to, I mean, it's, it's I'll, I'll, I'm gonna continue to, to digest it, Laura. So, but I, so I'll give you my knee jerk response, which is, which is, is what it is. I mean, um, yeah, um, I mean, I'm not, I mean, partly I, when you say common ground, you know, like, I mean, I want them to have a sort of, I do want us to cultivate a certain kind of common ground. Like I want us to have a common sense of, you know, how we should engage one another, right? And and be a community, of a, a truth seeking community that seems to me should be bound together by certain kinds of norms of mutual respect and openness, et cetera. Um, I don't get to the end of the class and count and try to, you know, I mean, I mean, if, if we get to the end of the class and, you know, uh, it's it's it, I mean I'm I'm not concerned if students uh you know are still more or less where they were politically and philosophically at the beginning of the class. My hope is just that they're um, I guess and this is just how I see education generally that education is 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 always about sort of opening students up a little bit right sort of uh, sort of opening them to other sorts of ways of seeing the world planting sort of intellectual seeds that might um, might sprout later on. I mean, when I think about how I changed my mind in my own life, you know, it was never, it was rarely in the course of just reading a book or even in a, in a single class, you know, it was something, it, it was something much more gradual and slow. And, and um, so, you know, I, I guess, I, I guess that's how I, imagine human psychology works normally, right? And how education should work. Um, but having said all that, Laura, I mean, it's a good, it's a damn good question, right? I, I need to think about this a little bit more. And um, 
and uh, it's something Phil and I should talk more about, uh, right? Um, so, I ask because I found myself recently uh, in this situation I referred to, and I could feel myself mm -hmm. desperately trying to find common ground to sort of settle things and mm. and realize that in doing so, I was silencing and not allowing certain people to really say what they needed to say to adjust the process. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think consensus building has its place, but then other, there are other times when seeking that common ground actually curtails great mm -hmm. discussion. So um, mm -hmm. it'd be, it'd be fascinating. And I'd, I'd love to be a fly on the wall for your classes. I just think it's, it's so wonderful. Anyway, I'll be, I'll be quiet. Thank you so no, much. Thank you, Laura. Oh. Thanks, Laura. So. I mean, I, I will say it's even trickier at home. My in-laws, who are very wonderful grandparents, who are helping me tremendously with my wife who's disabled, who are just the most loving and hands-on grandparents who I couldn't survive without, are Trump-loving, Jesus-loving, gun-loving, Black Lives Matter-hating, you know, gay, transgender-hating. Uh, <laughs> so I got to really navigate that shit because... Man, we, we are very close as a family and I love them dearly, but they say things that, you know, mortify my kids. Uh, actually, not just mortify my kids, but my kids actually get very distraught and distressed when they leave and they say, I can't believe grandma said this. I can't believe grandpa said that. Do they really think this? And I have to put, I find myself in the position of having to defend these statements that I find are heinous, but, but it's their grandparents. So what do you do? You know, it's tricky. To turn over to Terry Gibbs from uh, Minnesota. Terry. Great, thanks. Um, well, I had three questions, but uh, maybe combine two of them. Um, so, and, and sort of building related to what Laura was asking about, are there some topics like climate change or discrimination, injustice, GLBTQ, uh, where there may be common ground in terms of shared facts and concern? even if the solutions may be different, so different. And for those areas that are tricky and challenging, especially where neither side agrees on the facts, I'm curious how you move forward. And then a little bit related to that, maybe it's too specific an example. How do the conservative students feel about what occurred January 6th and the continuing large scale support for Trump and the threat he poses to primary Republicans that don't tow his line? And then I'm curious, how do the progressive students respond when they hear that? And the reason I ask is that, you know, Biden and those of us trying to find common ground are extremely frustrated about how locked in things are uh, for so many Republicans. It's like their political career is on the line. So I'm just curious how that discussion, the politics of that go, that reality that we have to confront. Yeah. Um, well, maybe I'll go first, Phil. Um, I mean, the well, the first question you asked, Terry, is about sort of what, if I understand it right, you're asking what do we what what do we do when students disagree on the social facts? That I yeah. hear. Right? Yeah. Or or you know, how does it go once they've agreed on mm -hmm. facts? I assume they just have different solutions. Um, but how often does that even happen that they can agree? Um, but when it, they don't agree, then how do you move forward? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't see it as our, um, I mean, sometimes we have to agree to disagree, right? I mean, right. You know, we've got different interpret, the world's complicated, there's different rational and reasonable interpretations, right? And sometimes that's the case, right? And there are issues that are just fundamentally hard ones. And I don't think we try to you know, um, um, it, it doesn't bother me if students, you know, end up with just different points of view that are that are rational and reasonable, so long as they have some sense of what counter views look like, right? I mean, right. like, like that's, that's really what I want them to be. So when I get a student in any of my classes, and if they've got strong political views, my my aim as a teacher, in my view, is to just make them more thoughtful, right? Like I want to make them more thoughtful conservatives or progressives, um, you know, and if I can do that well, I've, I feel like I've done um, a, a, a good job, right? Um, 
The the second point you're making about the capital invasion, was it, a, just so I understand, Terry, the, the question, was it a question narrowly about sort of conservative students and how they're, you know, di what, how they're making sense of those riots and, and what's happened to the GOP? Yeah, how they make sense of that. And, yeah. and then sort of the ongoing, you know, influence and sort of the locked in nature of where our politics are. Yeah. Well, maybe this isn't, this is sort of what you're asking, but I, I, I do think we're, I mean, we're, I mean, I see it, I mean, partly what I want to do with my conservative students is give them, I mean, a lot of them don't really have much exposure to the conservative philosoph philosophical and intellectual tradition, right? Yeah. So I want to, you know, I want to give them some alternative to what's become, I think, of the GOP. Right, like I mean, that's um, you know, and 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 I think this is a problem now. On it, it, I think it's a bigger problem on campuses without conservative professors, right? Like if you're a young conservative at say, you know, the University of Colorado, who is who there is going to help you be a thoughtful conservative, right? It seems to me that the, you know, what you've got really is sort of the conservative media verse, you know, where you have these camp, very populist campus groups like Turning Point USA. Um, and so, and actually that's relevant to our class because a lot, of the, a lot of the speakers who get into hot water are sometimes these very, are, are really those conservative bomb throwers, right? And I think one reason you get a lot of conservative bomb throwers, particularly on these big public universities, is there aren't there aren't conservative professors there to guide them in some way and say, hey, look, here are some more interesting, deeper conservative intellectuals, thinkers that, uh, that you could be inviting, right? Instead of Milo or whoever it is, right? So, um, so I, I think most conservatives on our campus these days are, um, uh, you know, I think they're in a sort of funny place because they're, they feel, they're feeling alienated from the Republican party um, and, um, and, but also they, they know they're not Democrats. They don't, they're not progressives. And so, um, I mean, that's not universally true. I mean, we do get some Trump supporters here and there, um, but, uh, but not too many. Well, Phil, what do you, you think? Oh, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I, I, I think I'll just let it ride because I'll just start ranting. So thanks for that, John. <laughs> Well, thank you both so very much. And thanks to all of you for uh, spending the time with us. We have one final question that came from, um, from one of our parents who thought this program was uh, spectacular for the, for the students. So on the way out, one last question, how can we do more of these for our students? More teen taught courses, more courses that, that show a lot of ideological diversity uh, with differing viewpoints. How can we make this happen to a greater degree? What's Just holding us back? This, this, is a, this is a great question. And it's something Phil and I was, we were working on this actually before the pandemic shut us down. So here's the challenge. Um, most professors are like other human beings, which is to say they tend to, they tend to, they tend to be, make, uh, they, they tend to become friends with people, with colleagues who are most like them, right? So that means you don't have a lot of, um, you know, uh, friendships like Phil and I's, right, is the bottom line. And so one of the things Phil and I discovered we really had to do is we had to set up people on dates, right? And this is what we did, seriously. So uh, before, uh, before everything shut down, we set up, we took two professors out to dinner. If I, I won't tell them, I won't share their names, Phil, I'll just sort of share the story. We took two professors out to dinner, one very conservative professor, um, one very left professor. In fact, these, these professors are much further apart than Phil and I are really politically. And so, but we thought they'd make a great team. And in particular, we thought that they might be interested in teaching a course on the gun debate. And we thought this would be a wonderful class to have. And, um, and I don't know what your, I sort of thought this was our, your experience too, Phil. At the dinner, we, I, I sort of felt nervous. Like I really, I really wanted these two folks to hit it off. I wanted them to like one another because I really wanted them to teach this course, right? And the dinner went, went great. Um, and they, had, they were planning on teaching this course together. 
Uh, but then a lot of contingent things happened. Uh, one of them went on, went on um, uh, sabbatical, then the pandemic hit, then the older professor decided to retire early. He's retiring this, um, this, this year, in fact, and so it all fell apart. So, but it, it showed us what I think has to happen, right? Uh, which is to say, I think Phil and I need to get back on this project next year. We need, to, we need to play matchmaker, right? We need to find the right people. We need to take them out to dinner. And this gets back to friendship. You know, this has sort of been a, a thread that's run through our discussion, right? Like you have, to, you have to get people to trust each other, right? Professors are taking some risk here. You know, professors, we're, 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 we're not, we don't like taking risks. You know, you don't want professors on your landing craft at Omaha Beach, right? Like we're not, we're not like brave souls, right? So like, you know, we, we, so, so you really need that to build that social trust. And, and I'm hopeful that Phil and I will, will start the, up that project again next fall. Great. Well, thank you both very much for your time. Uh, today, we hope to see you virtually soon and on campus, maybe next year when we can meet safely. Uh, thank you all so much for your participation. Uh, if you haven't heard about the Open Academy, do uh, search for it on our website. It's easily accessible. It is an absolutely spectacular initiative, uh, as Laura, Laura mentioned earlier. Uh, as always, please do reach out with any questions, concerns, or comments, alumni at cmc.edu. Have a great day, and we look forward to seeing you at future programs. Bye, all. Feel free to unmute, say hello, say goodbye. Thanks, guys.